We're going to continue on with this, uh, the lectures on signal processing and specifically the Fourier transform. And one of the things that we want to look at are the properties of, this, of the Fourier transform. In other words, when we go and commit ourselves to using a Fourier transform, what are the guarantees that we have on this transform that we know we can count on uh, in terms of uh, leveraging them for solving problems? All right, so remember what the Fourier transform here is defined as a pair that gets you into the Fourier domain and back from the Fourier domain. And in practice, uh, we execute this with something like the fast Fourier transform. So this is the Fourier transform pairing that we have to get in. You multiply by e to the minus i omega t in a great overall of time, that's here. And to get back out, when you're in the frequency domain, you multiply by e to the plus i omega t and you integrate over all of frequency space. And that's how you just get in and out of this. So it's an integral transformation, which means it's going to be a linear transformation. And so what we're going to do is walk through some of these properties, the first one being the linearity property, because this is probably the most important of all of them. So before we get there, though, let's just think about this more abstractly as a coordinate transformation, right? This is, this is all the Fourier transform really ultimately is, is a coordinate transform from time to this coordinate called frequency. Uh, and this is the representation of how we do this. I start from the time domain. This little script F is like my Fourier transform puts me in the frequency domain. And we've already talked about the frequency domain as being this ideal coordinate system where all the frequency modes are orthogonal to each other. So it gives you an infinite dimensional orthogonal space to put your signal into and then do your manipulations and understand the signal. And to come back, you do the inverse Fourier transform. So you start from the signal frequency domain, F inverse, which is uh, the inverse Fourier transform, and you get back to time. What's going to ultimately happen a lot for us is we're going to go move into the Fourier domain, we're going to manipulate the signal in the Fourier domain, and then we'll come back out. So it's not just go in there and come back because, you know, that's nothing happened along the journey into the Fourier domain. But once we get you in the Fourier domain, now we can do manipulations where we can really start to understand basic signal processing tricks that we want to do in that Fourier domain and then come back out. And we have a new signal that has some properties that are advantageous for us for representing the, uh, you know, the signal or cleans it up or whatever we want to do in terms of a signal processing application. All right, so another way to think about this that we've already thought about is remember that this representation of the Fourier domain is like our Fourier series A of Ks, right? So I trade out for my coordinate system, which was just time, into the A of Ks, which are the A of Ks are how much is it in the cosine T, cosine 2T, cosine 3T direction, uh, and then I can come from those coordinates back out to the time domain, okay? So that's our representation of the Fourier transform and what it's doing for us. And then let's start talking about walking through some of the properties that we're guaranteed to hold for us uh, throughout uh, the time we're using these signals. So the first is going to be linearity. So what we're going to look at here is two signals, X and Y. And this is what their transforms look like. So X takes you to this representation, capital X, and Y goes to capital Y. So this is it's Fourier series representation or Fourier domain representation of these two signals. So you can ask the question uh, about superposition. So if I have two signals that I add them together, linearly superimpose, then in fact, I can just linearly superimpose their Fourier domains as well. So here is the, the formula that we want to think about. So I take a signal X of T uh, with some coefficient A and I add to it B of Y of T, and the Fourier transform just gives me A times the representation of the Fourier modes in X plus B Fourier representation of the modes in Y. So linearity is critical. Remember, this is just a integral transform. So we know that linearity holds for integral, the integral trans, you know, for integration in general. And so it just holds here uh, as well. And so this allows us then to think about putting different signals in the Fourier domain, and I can just add them together. Um, and then bring them back and I get the mixed signal, the superimposed signal. So that's, that's an important property that we're going to be leveraging all the time in, in this, these calculations. Okay, so let's talk about this idea of what's called time shifting, property number two, which is time shifting, which is we have the Fourier transform, 
there it is. X of t walks me over into, into the Fourier domain, which is the frequency representation. And then I can ask a question, what happens if I take in a signal where I shift it in time? So I take x and I shift it in time a bit, x of t minus t naught. Then when I take the Fourier transform of this, here's what's interesting about this one. The Fourier transform gives me out the same signal as if x was not shifted times an exponential factor e to the minus i omega t naught. So in other words, what ends up happening here is I get a phase shift of the signal by doing a time shift. So time shifting in the time domain is equivalent to getting a phase shift in the frequency domain. And this kind of makes sense, right? Because in some sense, what's gonna happen, now you're seeing a different part of that signal. If you time shift a sine wave, you're just gonna see that sine wave at a different portion of its phase, essentially. It's gonna be the same sine wave, it's just that now with the shift, it's gonna be, well, okay, now, the time shift tells me I'm in a different phase cycle of that fundamental signal. You can work this out quite simply, right? You could take the signal x of t and you say this is the Fourier transform, right, of how to come back from the frequency domain to the time domain. And you can say, okay, well, if I just shift time there, put instead of t, t, t minus t naught, then notice what happens. You get this t minus t naught in this integral. So you have an e to the i omega naught t naught which can come out of this integral, right? It's no longer, because you're integrating with respect to uh, this, or, or actually, so you can pull it out and bring it together with the x e to i omega. And so now this is, remember, this is the Fourier transform pair. So this is now the representation in the Fourier domain, which you had the same representation of x and i omega, but now it's got this phase factor in front of it, the e to the minus i omega t naught. So it's a phase shift that you pick up in this, or another way to represent it is right here. There's your phase shift in front of the Fourier transform. Okay, so simple manipulation of the integrals are really what are gonna allow us to write down most of these properties. But that's one of them, right? Which is, you know, you get time shift leads to a phase shift in the frequency. Property number three is around this idea of conjugation. So again, we take our signal, x of t, and here's what it looks like in the Fourier domain, and conjugate it now. You take everywhere you see an i, you make it a minus i, so that's what the star means. So x of t, what happens when you do conjugation here, it pulls out x star and minus i omega. And this is gonna kind of make sense, right? Because now the omega, the i got turned into a minus i omega, and so now you have that thing there. And so um, the only other thing I will, any, and this is fairly easy to work out with the integrals uh, themselves. Okay, and so uh, so you have this here. You get pick up this here. And by the way, the only other thing to note is, oh my gosh, come on, is that uh, if if x of t is real, then what you end up doing here is x to minus i omega is equal to x star i omega. So there is this symmetry constraint, essentially, as it were, that gives us real signals. Uh, if, if, you, if this is true, then x of t actually itself is a real signal in, in, the, in the time domain. Okay, so that's property number three. Property number four is a scaling. Okay, again, we always start off with the Fourier transform. There it is. And the scaling is x, where if you rescale time, then how it shows up in the Fourier transform is you pick up this scaling of, first of all, the amplitude of the Fourier coefficients drop by one over absolute value of a, and then you get a rescaling of the frequencies by a. So instead of x being i omega, now they're x i omega over a. So this is just a rescaling of the frequencies, and this is the rescaling of their amplitude. Now this makes sense, right? I mean, if you, if, if you think about cosine t and cosine 2t, which is essentially a scaling factor of two, Cosine two is oscillating at twice the frequency. So that's why you would get the rescaling of the frequency components, right? So it's a pretty natural way to think about this, that if you were to now rescale any cosine by some, you know, cosine omega t, then that's gonna actually change the, the, how it looks like in the Fourier domain, and it's gonna change its spikes essentially in the Fourier domain by uh, the a factor that you have there. Okay, so you can rescale time and space, and this becomes important for us often in manipulating. Remember, when we do the fast Fourier transform, we're often going to take 
uh, a domain, whatever size period it is in time, and we're going to shift it down to size 0 to 2 pi. That's going to be an important piece of what the Fourier transform is typically thinking what we're doing is working on a 2 pi periodic domain. So we're going to make sure to transform all of our signals down to 2 pi periodic domains, which means we're going to be doing this. We're going to have to be shifting our time variable, and then we're going to have to interpret what that means in terms of the frequency contents itself. Okay? Property number five is this concept of duality. So duality is just, again, I have this Fourier transform pair, and I've, we've already seen this duality concept play out in practice a little bit, but let me just show you what it looks like in pictures. And the duality is this idea that whatever I see in the time domain, suppose I were to take the Fourier transform of this bump function, we've already shown that this on switch is a sync function in the Fourier domain. But if now I take a sync function in the Fourier domain, its Fourier transform is essentially a, this on switch in the Fourier domain, or vice versa. In other words, if I have a function and I have its Fourier transform, I can take its Fourier transform, and if that was the time domain, I run it through, it would give me back the time domain function. <laughs> okay? So that's the concept behind duality. I have these pairings that would come in. So whatever it looks like, here's the, what it looks like in the time domain, frequency domain. I can take this frequency domain picture, and if I put that in time, Fourier transform, it's going to give me back my time domain. And this is just from the fact that you're coming in with e to the i omega t, you're coming back out with minus e to the i omega t, uh, e to the minus i omega t, and so you get this nice symmetry properties between the Fourier domain and the time domain that you can use uh, for representing functions. Another way to say it, if you have something that looks really nice for you here in the Fourier domain that you like to see, uh, you could say, okay, so what would, you know, what would it take to get me that from the time domain? Then it's pretty easy to figure out what those properties might look like in, in, the, in the time domain. Okay, so duality is a, an important piece of what we have for the Fourier transform pairs. And you'll see this when you look at Fourier transform tables. Uh, the duality is all there. If you've worked out a Fourier transform for a function and you get a certain Fourier transform, effectively you've worked out the Fourier transform for what it looks like in the Fourier domain as well. You have Parseval uh, relationship, which is kind of a very interesting one. What it says for you is that if you take this absolute value squared of the signal, integrate it, it's equivalent, it's equal to one over two pi if you integrate over all the frequency content that you would have in that signal, okay, here, okay? so. And then the most important property, and this is the last one I'm going to finish with, I didn't even list it as a property. It's just more of a showstopper. This one here is super important, highly useful, because Fourier transforms allow us to differentiate functions. And let me show you how it's done. So you take us, again, here's the definition of the Fourier transform. And so now what we're going to do is write this out in integral terms. Here's the integral of it. And then we're going to take the time derivative of both sides. So the time derivative on the left is super simple. It's just x dot. And now the time derivative can come into here, right? Because, you know, we're integrating respect to omega. And we can differentiate this. And here's what you get. Very simple. And so when you get this, you get x dot is equal to, here's the Fourier transform. And here's now, essentially, it's here's what the frequency content looked like. So in the Fourier domain, what happened is you have your x i omega, which is the Fourier transform of the signal itself and the time derivative just picks up a factor of i omega so that's it so in the Fourier domain it's very easy to do a differentiation if you're in the Fourier domain just multiply i omega you've got the derivative this is kind of an amazing trick because now you can say all right that's that's nice so if i want to differentiate a function all i have to do is take its Fourier transform in the Fourier domain multiply the i omega come back. I now have, I've now done a signal processing trick where I've differentiated my signal. Okay. More broadly, if you take the nth derivative, so here we go, x of nth t, all you have to do to take n derivatives of a function, throw it into the Fourier domain and multiply by i omega to the nth power. Okay. So this is a fantastic differentiation algorithm. Most differentiation, right, we think about slope formulas, like I rely on
nearby points, a point in front, point behind, rise over run type formulas, and we can refine them to make them more accurate. But this does a completely different way of evaluating the girls. You move yourself into the Fourier domain, and how many derivatives you want, just multiply by i omega to whatever number of derivatives you want. That's the representation. You're, manip you're manipulating these underlying Fourier series representation of the derivative, changing the weights according to this formula, and then coming back. And so that gives you a very, uh, in fact, this is a very accurate estimate of the derivative. It's one of the best derivative estimates you could come up with. If you have a generic function and you want to differentiate it, this is one of the best ways to do it. Of course, there's assumptions on your signal that, for instance, they're periodic or nearly periodic. Otherwise, this won't maybe do as well, uh, good of a job as some other differentiation techniques. But if you can get away with using this technique, it's going to give you your best shot at getting a good derivative uh, approximation of a function. Okay, so that kind of highlights the broad, let's say, um, properties of the Fourier transform. And again, it's a linear transform. That's probably the most important thing. But then already I've shown you here that you can start using some of the properties, like for instance, to do pretty incredible signal processing tricks like taking derivatives. This is a, a standard thing you might want to do, for instance, even in control, like a PID control, where you need proportional integral differential. Right away, in the Fourier domain, you get di differential part trivially, because all you have to do is you know, once you're in the Fourier domain, a derivative is just I omega, multiplied by I omega, and that gives you already uh, a differentiation of that signal in the time uh, of, of what it would look like in the time domain. So those are some of the properties, and now we're going to start uh, building on these themes and just continue to look at all of the possibilities we have available to us in using Fourier modes and, and their uh, Fourier series representations for signals.